Welcome to CIPA, the Columbia School of International and Public Affairs. My name is John Coatsworth. I'm the dean. Um, we have students from around the university uh, who are here. Welcome to you all. One note uh, before we begin, I have a previous engagement at 1 o'clock for a, uh, an academic event, a class actually. Um, so I'd like you to pay no attention at all when I sneak out the side door partway through the discussion. Over the past year, the WikiLeaks organization has released hundreds of thousands of classified U.S. documents, some relating to military operations in Afghanistan and elsewhere, many others classified communications among State Department personnel located throughout the world. The release of this information, its dissemination throughout the world, and the subsequent debate over how to assess the impact of the leaks and their publication raise broad issues of public policy, especially in a democracy. The purpose of this panel is to address these issues. It's a, kind of an example of how fast the news travels uh, and how quick SEPA can respond uh, to events uh, and developments as they break. So I want to begin uh, by thanking SEPA's senior associate dean, Troy Eggers, who um, first thought of doing this panel and then made it happen. So thanks. Now let me introduce our panelists uh, and thank them as I do so. Hassan Abbas, the far end, is the Kaid Yassam Professor associated with the South Asia Institute. He teaches courses on politics, religion, and security in South Asia. He is also senior advisor at the Belfair Center for Science and International Affairs at the Harvard Kennedy School. Prior to his academic career, Professor Abbas served as a Pakistani government official in the administrations of Prime Minister Bhutto and Musharraf. Emily Bell, who's second here, is a professor of professional practice and director of the Toe Center for Digital Journalism at the Columbia Journalism School. Before joining Columbia, Professor Bell was director of digital content for Britain's Guardian News and Media and was editor-in-chief of the Guardian Unlimited. Ron Lieberman, who is next to Professor uh, uh, Abbas, is Professor of Political Science and Public Affairs here at SIPA. He's also served as Vice Dean for the school, uh, which is a life sentence, actually. <laughs> uh, and uh, when he returns from uh, sabbatical, he will resume that post. His research interests are in American political development, and his work has won numerous awards, including the Lionel Trilling Prize here at Columbia. Austin Long, sitting next to Professor Lieberman, is an assistant professor of international and public affairs here at SIPA. Professor Long previously worked as an associate political scientist for the RAND Corporation, serving in Iraq as an advisor to the U.S. military. He has authored Deterrence from Cold War to Long War and spends much of his time on the ground in Iraq, recently also in Afghanistan. Professor Gary Sick, seating next to Austin Long, is an adjunct professor of international and public affairs and a senior research scholar at the Middle East Institute. Professor Sick served on the National Security Council under Presidents uh, Ford, Carter, and Reagan and was the principal White House aide for Iran during the Iranian Revolution and the hostage crisis that followed it. He is the author of All Fall Down, America's Tragic Encounter with Iran, and October Surprise, America's Hostages in Iran and the Election of Ronald Reagan. Finally, I want to thank Pre Pre uh, President Bollinger for joining us here today. Um, he is a renowned First Amendment scholar, as you know, and recently published a book which I recommend to all of you, entitled Uninhibited, Robust, and Wide Open, A Free Press for a Global Society. He also recently published um, an op-ed uh, piece in the Wall Street Journal calling for strengthening the government's role in financing journalism, creating an American world service that can compete with the BBC and other global broadcasters and support a free press around the world as it does so. He has been enormously helpful to SIPA and a great friend, and we're thrilled to have him here. Um, I turn the conversation over to him now to frame the issues and moderate the discussion. Lee. Thanks, John. Um, <laughs> so, 
So thank you, John, and um, it's a tremendous thing, a, a sign of the, I think, the vitality of this school that uh, something as important uh, as um, current uh, should put together a panel of uh, such distinguished people to talk about it and for all of you to come out in the middle of uh, finals or near finals and, uh, and to think about this. So uh, it's terrific. Uh, I think there are several issues uh, here that are worth separating out and uh, we'll talk about them. Each panelist can talk for five minutes or so and uh, then we'll, we'll have a conversation here and then open it up uh, to questions. The first question from my standpoint uh, is uh, the First Amendment. How do, how do we analyze the First Amendment and public policy uh, framework for a question like WikiLeaks? And I'll come back to that in just a second and, and make uh, some opening comments. There's a major question that's posed by this about the role of journalism and how decisions are reached about what classified information to disclose and which not to disclose, and uh, are, we, um, are we happy and comfortable with the choices that have been made in the context of uh, these particular disclosures. There's an interest also in government secrecy and how, uh, how are the publication of these documents and the purloining of them uh, affecting uh, our, the ability of the government uh, here and uh, in other governments to operate with some degree uh, of, uh, of secrecy. There are very significant questions about the effects uh, on global security and global public policy, uh, foreign affairs, uh, that uh, emerge from the publication, not only from the standpoint of the United States, but from other nations around the world. What are the consequences for foreign affairs, foreign policies, and national security. So we've got the government's ability to, to uh, keep information secret, we've got journalism and the choices that they make about what to publish, and we've got uh, questions both nationally and globally uh, about the effects of all of these uh, on foreign policy and security. And I think the last question, and perhaps the one we're least able to, uh, to analyze here just because of the expertise that's brought to the discussion, is what does all this mean about technology, about where technology is going, uh, about how it can be changed, about uh, the ability of uh, people to get information and the p ability of governments to keep information from being released. So those are the major questions I would frame. Going back to the First Amendment, let me just say this in a very, very quick way. Every society has to, every society has to come up with some balance between the interest of the state or the government in being able to operate uh, with some degree of privacy and secrecy and the ability of the public and the press in helping the public to know what is going on in the government. We, we all know as a, just a reasonable fact that we could not have an effective government if everything that the government does uh, were to be public. So there is a real interest we all have in, in secrecy in, in government. On the other hand, we also know that government, governments always overclassify. They always use more secrecy than, in fact, uh, they should be entitled to. It's just the nature of the organization. And therefore, there's a very strong public interest in knowing a lot of what goes on in the government, even though the government classifies it as secret. So how do you strike that balance? And how do you do it when you have a constitutional right of free speech and free press? Well, the United States came up We've come up with an answer to that question. It happens to be probably the most pro-disclosure, pro-free press result of any country in the world. But here's our answer. The answer came in Pentagon Papers in the 1970s. The answer is a messy compromise. The compromise is this. Under the Pentagon Papers case and some related cases, the government can do any classification it wants. There's no judicial review under the First Amendment of how the government operates with respect to secrecy. 
So if you say, as a member of the public or the press says, we should know what the government's policy is or the papers are or the meetings that they've had on X issue, there's no First Amendment right to get that. So the government can do anything it wants consistent with the First Amendment to keep things from the public. On the other side, the press, if it can get its hands on any documents, even documents that have been illegally taken from the government, the press has a full right to publish them. And there are certain limits on this, and it's quite complicated actually when you get into the case, the Pentagon Papers case deeply, and I may do that later, but, but there is a, an exception for, let's call it, grave and irreparable harm in the nature of people being killed as a result of loss of life as a result of publication. But absent the government showing that, the press can publish just about anything it wants. So it sets up what has been described as a war between the press and the United States government. The government can classify and keep whatever it wants secret, and the press can try to get whatever leaks it can, even though they're taken illegally. And if it can get them, it can then publish it uh, as it wishes. For those people who are leakers, they have no First Amendment rights. So if you're a government official, if you're a SEPA graduate and you're going into the government, just be aware, if you decide to leak information from the government to the press, and you think you've got a First Amendment right to do that because the press has got a First Amendment right to do it, you're wrong. And uh, under the Espionage Act of 1917, there's a very good chance you may spend some time in jail should the government decide to prosecute you. One of the interesting things about the last 100 years is that uh, as all of this was uh, put together, there have been very, very few cases brought by the government against leakers. Uh, but in a couple, they've been quite successful. And every government says we're going to go after leakers because we're sick and tired of people leaking. But then when they do, and they really try to do it, they end up not bringing very many cases. So that's the basic First Amendment framework. And now I think the interesting question for somebody like me who's spent their lives thinking about the First Amendment constitutional law and related public policy. The very big question on the table is, does the WikiLeaks case show that the world has changed in material and meaningful ways such that the balance that was struck in Pentagon Papers is no longer viable and that the Supreme Court is going to have to undertake a new evaluation of the world as it is, the WikiLeaks world, and come up with a different balance? And we can talk about that more in the context of, um, of the general discussion, but let me turn this over now to Emily uh, for her comments. Emily? Uh, thank you. Um, I look at this from the point of view as, uh, 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 of, of professional journalism and how WikiLeaks has changed um, how we think about journalism and also how we think about what the free press might be in the 21st century. Um, and I'm very pleased that... Uh, uh, President Bollinger used a very important word um, in relation to the Pentagon Papers, which is messy, uh, because, of course, one of the things is that we've, we've used a, a certain set of words to describe what we think is going to happen to uh, journalism in the digital age, uh, and yet we've really lacked what I call a proof of concept. In other words, we've lacked an event which illustrates uh, how this is really materially going to ch change journalism, and I believe that WikiLeaks was that event. So when we talk about journalism becoming about data uh, as well as about narrative, what we one illustration of WikiLeaks is that um, when I see it's been compared possibly unfavorably to the way in which uh, the Pentagon Papers were leaked, saying, well, Daniel Ellsberg uh, actually uh, took much more time and care in terms of uh, the documents that he was removing from the Pentagon. He did it with a very specific purpose in mind. Uh, well, he also did because actually there's a kind of a physical capacity issue. And when he took them to the New York Times, they still needed a shopping cart to get them from one side of the floor to the other. So in, in the way that information is going to come to light, it's much easier to 
download unedited large files of information onto very small removable devices than it is to actually think how much paper can I physically get out of the building. So that's kind of one way in which it's really changed. Um, if you're then an editor who has the thumb drive dropped on their desk, what, what, what do you do with it? Um, well, first of all, you have to have the capacity to be able to host and sift and publish that data. Uh, now, four, four years ago, uh, Julian Assange and a set of uh, really sort of com computer engineers, but who had a, a publishing philosophy. Uh, and if you read uh, Assange's 2006 essay about why he was doing WikiLeaks, you know, his, his philosophy stands, I would say, at, a, at, a, at an extreme point to where um, the established press stands now, which is that the more disclosure we can bring about, the better it is for democracy, which is, is dealing in a kind of an absolute that most newspaper editors, in truth, on a day-to-day -day basis, don't deal with. So the first thing is that you know, it doesn't really matter whether or not, it matters, I think, for legal reasons, it doesn't really matter whether or not you classify WikiLeaks and Julian Assange as, as journalists. They are doing part of the process that would have been only done, really, by journalistic organisations um, five to ten years ago. So that's a really significant change, and I don't believe it's going to um, roll back. So, in other words, I think that you will only see more of this type of operation uh, rather than um, fewer. Uh, what we also saw was some, something of a kind of a light shone. So when, when, when the leaks had arrived, we, we, we saw something of the process now that happens um, in terms of a new type of network and dis distributed journalism. So one really crucial way in which journalism changed through WikiLeaks is that certainly in my professional lifetime, um, even at The Guardian, um, I can count on you know, the things of one hand, uh, times when we actually collaborated um, in such depth and certainly at the same time as a number of other, in fact I don't think we ever collaborated with a number of other news organisations in the same way that we did with WikiLeaks, which is simply to say, well, you know, the world of information is globalised and journalism now um, the, ha has become a real-time, a, a genuinely real-time activity. So the coordination and the publishing uh, and the editing of the cables was done in a collective and distributed way, which is a very interesting and counter-intuitive um, way for the press to behave. And then probably the most important thing uh, about this, which is going back to uh, President Budgeon's point about um, having sort of slightly messy rules around this, is, is that disclosure is obviously done in a, in a messy and controversial way. It always has been, and that's always been part of the press, press's role, sometimes to go too far and sometimes not to go far enough, because there are no hard and fast rules in this area. Um, what we have seen, though, is that disclosure now has another element to it, which is uh, the free press of the 21st century we, we, we imagined would be the internet. And to some extent, the publication of the WikiLeaks documents and what happened subsequently, in other words, this idea that when you host, you know, very few organisations would have the servers on which to host that amount of data. So they, very few organisations would actually have the centralised um, infrastructure that they had all within, uh, sort of, in other words, um, the Guardian owns its own presses. It doesn't own the... Um, Estate, sorry, not the estate agents, it doesn't own the um, news agents or the, or the supermarkets that distribute it, but it has a large control, it has a large control over how it actually sells, prints, produces um, its product. Uh, what we've seen illustrated is that actually the, 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 we possibly don't have a free internet in the way that we understand that we do. In other words, the public sphere is not regulated on the internet and it's largely taken up by private concerns whose primary motivation is not to put uh, free information into the public sphere. So in other words, if Amazon wants to take um, WikiLeaks off its servers, it's perfectly entitled to do so uh, because it, it's a commercial organisation. If PayPal wants to refuse to handle uh, WikiLeaks payments, it's perfectly entitled to do so. If MasterCard wants to stop its account, it's perfectly entitled to do so. And I think this raises some really, really, really important questions for press organisations and actually for, for, for the regulation of the internet in general as we go forward about what this public sphere might be and what the free press and how, how, the, how the functions of journalism fit into that. Because we're not going to be able to clarify journalism as just a function done by certain organisations bits of it will be done in ways that we haven't properly understood yet. Uh, and WikiLeaks has really sort of illustrated how 
uh, it might be done. Um, and so I think that in some ways it's a, it's a great time to be having this debate uh, because we've conceptually thought about it before, but we haven't seen what actually might happen and we haven't seen the pressure points and where things break uh, in relation to, to, to freedom of speech. So I, think, I, I don't think it's overstating it to say that this is a really pivotal moment for journalism and the way that journalists and journalistic organisations will have to think about organising themselves and have to think about how they engage with um, regulation uh, certainly sort of will change from here on in. Emily, let me, let me pursue. Ask each of the panelists as we go uh, a question or two. One of the things that was quite striking about the Pentagon Papers case uh, was that when Daniel Ellsberg got these 47 volumes or whatever they were uh, of a history of the um, U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War, and he handed them over to the New York Times and the Washington Post. The New York Times and the Washington Post uh, reportedly called up the Attorney General and said, you know, we, we've got these um, 47 volumes and um, we're planning to publish them. We would be, we wanted to let you know that and we'd be interested in, uh, in if you have any reactions about uh, this. And, and of course the answer was, we'll see you in court. We're going to, to sue you and uh, don't publish them. Um, when Bob Woodward, um, but they gave, the point is, New York Times, Washington Post gave the U.S. government an opportunity to go through them and to say, don't publish this, it's too dangerous, and so on. When Bob Woodward publishes his series of books about, uh, he gets a lot of classified information, he gets a lot of secret documents. I'll bet you, I mean, I, 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 more than that, I know because I sit on the board of the Washington Post Company, that, that Bob Woodward calls up the director of the CIA and says, uh, you know, we're thinking about publishing this. I'm thinking about publishing. Well, tell me if you think it's... What I want to know is, did The Guardian do that in this case? Did The New York Times do that? Did Le Monde do that? Did, how much interaction is there at this stage of life between mm. the press and the government over, please don't publish this, please, you know. There, there is, in my experience, and I can't speak specifically in this case because I was not in Alan Rusbridge's office when the, when the conversations were being held, we know what happened with the New York Times because Bill Keller has, has written about and spoken about yep. it, which is that they did contact yep. um, the White House and they did ask for their help in terms of what were redacted from the uh, documents. Um, in my experience, it's very, very, very unusual indeed for a news organisation when you have this type of material, not to have any kind of contact prior to publication. In other words, you would ordinarily... In other words, have... you would always have a conversation. Yep. Um, it would be unusual, I would say, to show them the documentation, not least because uh, this is a slightly different case because we, we, we think we know who, who, who leaked the documents, we think it was Brad, Bradley Manning. Um, often uh, just even showing people the material in, in a document can lead to the disclosure of a source. So normally you would, never show, you would never show the material. You might talk through it or you might simply give a polite, what we call, heads up. Um, and one of the you know, one of the interesting, um, I suppose, issues that comes out of this is to what extent, particularly at the moment when the press is not financially as robust as it has been at some points in the past sort of 30 to 40 years, uh, to what extent it feels nervousness about right. uh, being... Um, really seeing its core purpose as holding power to account because that inevitably informs the decision about how much you involve your, um, if you like, the, the establishment in deciding what is and isn't, isn't published about it. Well, what that's very interesting. I mean, that's, that's counter to what one might think. That is, you're saying if, if I'm running the press, a newspaper, and, and I'm really financially uh, strapped, I may be less inclined to publish it if the government says don't publish it. I, because, well, I would think you would be more inclined to publish it because you'd want more sensational coverage and therefore you'd want... I, I, I think that's... I mean, I think that... that that possibly it's also to do with the context of American press at the moment. Yeah, yeah. And I think that national security has played a much, a, a far different part in the past 10 years in how the um, collective consciousness of the American press operates. And that's substantially different, for instance, to how the UK and European press in, uh, uh, reacts. So the Guardian has published more cables, for instance, than the New York Times has. So there is just a sort of, you can do a, a simple um, quantitative analysis 
of what uh, a US publisher thinks is newsworthy and in the public interest and what uh, worldwide press think is in the public interest. And just to pin that down, in this global, in, in the Pentagon Papers, then we'll go to Gary, in the Pentagon Papers, you had two American institutions that clearly had some sense of patriotism to the United States, right? I mean, it would just, the Sulzberger family and the Graham family and the editors and so on, they would, I assume the Guardian doesn't feel, and Lamone doesn't feel that they have a patriotic interest to the United, is that right? No, I think and, that, and yeah. And WikiLeaks surely yeah. does not. Julie's no, no I, th I, th I think that that is a fair assessment of the situation. Mm -hmm. um, I would just say, you know, on, 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 on but really talking about the, the non-patriotic -patri nature, uh, possibly of the coverage, I don't think the Guardian would have been any different were it the UK government, interestingly. We're not, yeah. we, were, we were not known for our patriotism, yeah. in inverted commas. Um, but, 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 but it's an interest, again, I think that this is where we've really seen journalism change, which, as I said before, we talk about distributed and network journalism yeah. and globalization, and actually we now have a kind of a proof of concept of, of what that might look like. Yeah, and so, right, in, other words, right. in other words, what the, what the New York Times is doing, it knows what's going into the public domain. Anybody, can, anybody with an internet um, yeah. connection can access any of those cables and look at them on any site. So, in other words, it's a kind of a, a almost like a brand decision on the part of the New York Times about what it thinks yeah. is appropriate to publish rather than, well, do you know what? Everybody's decided that at some point this will be in the public domain, so we might as well go ahead and publish it. Yeah. And I think that's an interesting nuance. Uh, Gary, you, I think we're all really interested in how you see the effects of all of this on foreign policy and, uh, and is this a new world in which foreign policy... And, and security, international and, and national, uh, is going to... Are, are people in the NSC and the State Department, they just, my God, I mean, this is... We've, we've got to get prepared for this new world, or is this life as usual? Well, I, um, <clears throat> of course, haven't read all of it, and, of course, we, only a small part of it has actually been released so far. We've got, I think, less than 1%, supposedly, that has come out. And some of that is available in various sources. Uh, first of all, I should say that I'm a consumer. I'm not a, I'm not a journalist, though I think I'm becoming more of a journalist because the line, uh, as Emily pointed out, gets pretty blurred sometimes in terms of what you're doing. Uh, I run a listserv. I run a uh, website. And I put stuff out on my blog. And so does that make me a journalist? I don't know. But as a consumer, I would categorize this information dump in as three different kinds. First of all, the first category I would say is ho-hum. I mean, it's really business as usual in the uh, international diplomatic community. Nothing new, nothing exciting. A few tidbits here and there, uh, perhaps some confirmation of things that we didn't know otherwise. But basically, that whole first category, which I think is more than 99% of the WikiLeaks that I have seen thus far, could, in fact, have been released next week or next month if somebody had submitted an FOIA, a Freedom of Information request. It's absolutely doable. And uh, so is this a huge secret that's going to change everybody? It speeded it up. And maybe this is uh, something that is true of the Internet generally. It speeds things up. But so we got to the point of knowing about some of this stuff faster than we would have otherwise. But I'm not talking here 30 years. I'm talking a matter of weeks or months if anybody wanted to put in a request. The second category I would call titillating. Uh, this lets us peek behind the veil of what people are saying to each other in high places. Uh, and listen to their gossip. And that's basically what 90% of it is. It's high-level gossip. And if anybody who has spent time in the government and reading cables, including CIA cables, I must say, uh, that's what a lot of it is, is just gossip. Uh, getting that out in the papers, you know, uh, I don't know, as a journalist, is that there, there are things, for instance, we have the Arabs saying to the American uh, diplomats, you know, cut off the head of the, the Persian snake. Well, maybe that shocked you, um, but 
You know, it didn't shock me particularly. And I think that this is something which I, anybody who was a careful reader of stuff that was going on would know that. And this is more graphic. It's, uh, and as I say, it's titillating, so it makes good headlines. Uh, the people who say it are sometimes embarrassed, though in the Arab case, I think they're not very embarrassed by that. The uh, fact that they don't like Iran is not something that's going to hurt them uh, terribly with their own populations. There's a third category, which is minuscule, which I would call harmful. Let me give you one quick example. Uh, I read one cable, which has not appeared in either The Guardian or The New York Times uh, section, but was released by WikiLeaks, which was about U.S. negotiations with a Middle East country to buy back their uh, man pads, their uh, shoulder-fired uh, anti-aircraft missiles. These are portable. They're very dangerous. If they fall in the hands of terrorists, they could kill you and me uh, as we come in or out of an airport someplace. Uh, they and the government in, char in, in this case agreed to let them go, uh, to sell them back to the Americans with the proviso that it be kept secret. And before they had finished the transaction, uh, this was made public. I think that is utterly irresponsible, no matter how you look at it, and the fact that it raises the question to me, what does WikiLeaks think it's doing? What is its real objective? I went back and read Julian Assange's so-called manifesto that he wrote some time ago, and in a little tiny piece about op-ed length, he used the word conspiracy 33 times. He thinks he's fighting conspiracies that that is what governments do. They conspire behind closed doors, and so by throwing all this stuff out there, somehow, magically, you're going to stop conspiracies from happening. I've really looked at the stuff pretty carefully that's come out so far, and I'm hard-pressed to find a real conspiracy that has been revealed. Lies, hypocrisy, absolutely. But anybody who can't deal with you know, lies and hypocrisy has no business being in international relations. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's the name of the game. Uh, so I don't, I don't call lies and hypocrisy a conspiracy. Uh, they are unpleasant, perhaps, and I don't object to having them brought out in the open, but it doesn't change my way of thinking. Uh, because I want to leave time for other people, I will close off, but I do have one other point that I really do want to make. And that is that one of the things revealed uh, by these cables, and it's a, an irony, which I think the, thing, the whole thing is full of ironies, uh, they actually, uh, re, you know, the, they reported over and over again as people were talking to these American diplomats, what did they want? They wanted the Americans to come in and solve their problems for them. They weren't saying, here is our plan, like the Arabs dealing with Iran. They didn't say, here's what we plan to do about those terrible Persians. They said, why don't you Americans do something? Cut off the head of the snake, attack, put in troops if necessary to solve this problem. At the same time, other parts of their government were saying to us, going in there militarily would be a catastrophe for the entire region. And it seems to me we were getting a pretty interesting story from the people who were talking to us. They seemed to be saying to their American colleagues, I will hold your coat in private while you take action that I publicly deplore. And when it produces a catastrophe, I'll say, I told you so. That's sort of what we're hearing from all of these other countries. I would love to see a WikiLeaks dump on what goes on inside WikiLeaks. And I would also really like to see a similar information dump in terms of what's going on inside some of the governments that we're talking about, Saudi Arabia, Iran, uh, Central, you know, Central Europe, there's a whole range of countries that would be in many ways probably more interesting than the American cables. Unfortunately, it's like looking where the light is strongest, that's what happened, that's what they got, and that's what they're publishing. And I think we have to approach it with a bit of a grain of salt about in terms of, of how big this really is. Thank you, Gary. Austin? Yeah, I actually agree quite a lot with uh, Gary's perspective on this. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how this happened, uh, since I'm, I'm probably closest to, to that part of the, 
the equation. Uh, when I worked in Iraq, I had a position not entirely dissimilar to that of, of uh, PFC Bradley Manning. Um, so how does, how does a lowly, you know, private uh, in a Ford operating base uh, about 70 kilometers east of Baghdad uh, get a hold of, you know, not only the 260,000 odd cables, but also a lot of data on operations in Afghanistan and Iraq, um, as well as some uh, video that you may remember that came out last year uh, from, from various gun cameras on helicopters. How does that actually happen? Well, I, I chalk it up to three sort of related factors. The first was after the September 11th attacks, um, there, was a, there was a huge outcry about, you know, how did this so-called intelligence failure happen? And the, the diagnosis came down to a few things, uh, two of the most important of which were uh, a failure of imagination, that the intelligence community simply couldn't imagine an attack of this type would take place because they were too closed off, they didn't think outside of the box enough, et cetera. And two, there was not enough information sharing. And that, uh, you know, different parts of the government did not receive information from, from one another and were therefore not able to, quote, connect the dots. Uh, so the response to this was get people to think outside of the box more and also to make sure that, that, that none of these stovepipes or, or channels uh, were blocked off and to make information readily available. And this was uh, incorporated into the, to the same law that created the Director of National Intelligence uh, in 2005. So that's one factor, uh, the, the desire to create outside of the box thinking and uh, the, the spread of, in, of intelligence across the community in order to prevent future attacks. The second was, uh, you know, the same thing that sort of swept over the rest of the world in this time period, the information uh, technology revolution. Uh, you know, not so very long ago, the term cable meant cable, like really, you know, teletype cable, um, as you would see in, in an old movie. Now it's, it's all electronic. Uh, the same is true of intelligence reporting of all sorts, human intelligence reports, signals intelligence reports. Every kind of report in the world is now electronic. And uh, just as you can now you know, do various Google searches for, for any number of things, you know, the intelligence community has adopted a similar architecture so that you can go searching for whatever it is you think you need in order to serve that, that first function, which is to think outside of the box and to share information. So that, that first factor was amplified uh, a thousandfold by the ability to, to, to harness it to information technology. And the third, and I think why this came out of... Uh, uh, contingency operating base hammer in Iraq and not out of the Central Intelligence Agency's headquarters in Langley or Foggy Bottom or any place like that, is you have these two other factors interacting with a military environment. And not just a military environment, but a tactical military environment. So, you know, it, it, there are various places you can go in the world now that are essentially uh, a hole in the ground, but it has a classified computer terminal in it. Uh, and it literally has access to all of the same stuff that the, the same terminal sitting in Tampa or Washington would have. So the, the strictures and guidelines uh, that, that one would put in place to manage this information, um, I think almost inevitably become more lax um, because people are worried about getting killed, not about a security violation. So in PFC Manning's case, he was able to bring in uh, blank uh, CD-ROMs uh, and pretend to be listening to Lady Gaga which I assure you, having spent 14 plus hours a day, uh, you know, staring at three or four computer terminals, you need something to keep awake. So everybody has headphones on. This is not unusual. He pretends to be listen listening to Lady Gaga, and he's just click, 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 click. He had probably 14 hours a day in the classified environment, six to seven days a week for months at a time. Uh, it, it, in some sense, it's amazing he did not, he did not, he was not able to sort of download more data than he actually did. Um, so that's sort of where this comes from. Is there anything we can do about it? I, I think there is. Uh, it will require uh, reversing uh, a number of the things that, that came under that first category. Uh, you'll have to, to make what's called need to know actually much more operative rather than being able to just do a Google search for any kind of you know, secret level information. There, there may be a need to know and that's, that's technically possible. Um, it would require having things like certificates. I mean, you, you, you've, you've experienced all these things in your, in your regular life. You, it would just be translating into a classified environment. It can, it can be done. Um, so, you know, that's, that's where this comes from. In terms of, of its uh, importance, uh, I tend to agree with Gary that, that most of this uh, is overhyped. Um, there's, there's not much evidence of, of conspiracy. And, in fact, we had Ambassador 
Khalil Zad, former Columbia professor and ambassador Khalil Zad, uh, here a couple of weeks ago. And he, he described uh, Bob Woodward's recent book, Obama's Wars, uh, as, as being vastly more damaging in, in every way imaginable than, than WikiLeaks has been so far, because it revealed information that was you know, classified beyond top secret in a sense. It was code word level information about very sensitive cross-border operations into Pakistan and any number of other, uh, of other things. And this was not just some you know, private in, in Iraq leaking this. These were senior U.S. government officials that passed this to Bob Woodward. So I, I, while I think there are some technical things that can be put in place to limit uh, the kind of damage that occurred with WikiLeaks, <laughs> Uh, the, the reality is, is, as long as you know, very senior U.S. government officials can leak uh, the most sensitive information the U.S. government has and, and do so with impunity. I mean, Bradley Manning is going to jail. I mean, he's waiting for an Article 32 hearing right now. Uh, none of the senior folks in the Obama administration are going to jail. So unless that changes, um, I, I, I think we're going to continue to, you know, the United States is going to continue to suffer from these kind of problems. I, I guess I... I all this is uh, quite fascinating, I think, to uh, to go through. I, I I said before when we were just chatting uh, before coming out here that the journalists I've talked to, and Emily can speak to this uh, as well, but uh, journalists of major organizations, they feel that this is a very, very significant trove of information. I'm just the... the, the Thousand documents that have been released, and and um, and yet both of you feel that it's actually apart from gossip and maybe one or two things, uh, really not that significant. I, I wonder just so we, we should talk about that some, uh, and we we will. Um, is the government responding to this in the way that you see it? That is. Do Bob Gates and Hillary Clinton and, and the other people sit around saying, you know, this is not that harmful. And we don't want to, because it's not that harmful, we don't need to take dramatic action to stop this from being repeated. Or are they saying, this may not be that important, but my God, what is what this shows is the possibility of really significant things coming out, and we better take some action. Or third, do they say this is actually really important stuff, and we better take some action? Where do you think they fit in on on this? Well, actually, Bob Gates has um, said publicly yes. that he doesn't think that it's such a big deal. And, and I always and wonder the, though whether he's we'll spinning survive, that. The, yeah. We'll survive the shock. Um, in terms of how big a deal it is, I just uh, I hope all of you are familiar with the National Security Archive in Washington, which declassifies information, and they have cables more recent than the WikiLeaks dump that have been declassified appropriately and put on their website. And a lot of them are just as interesting, in some cases I think more interesting than the ones. What bothers me most about the WikiLeaks dump is that it's a dump. It is, it's indiscriminate, it's just whatever mm -hmm. the guy got, it is being dumped out in public. And I don't call that journalism. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, it's not just that it can do great damage. Here and there, there's going to be some damage done. But mostly, it's just irresponsible. That uh, It has no particular meaning. So when The Guardian narrows that down and focuses it on a particular subject, day by day, fine, I'm all in favor of that, or the, the Times boils them down and comes mm -hmm. up with several stories, that's one thing. But just, I don't call it journalism, when you just suck up anything that you get anywhere and just dump it on yeah. the public without any real I mean, one of the, uh, uh, Gary, just one side comment, one of the things that'll be interesting in the First Amendment context, the framework I gave at the beginning, if this were ever to come to litigation or prosecution against WikiLeaks, the way this could be framed is, is WikiLeaks like the leaker? Uh, that is like Daniel Ellsberg, the, uh, the uh, person who assists, or is WikiLeaks the press like the New York Times? And that will be an interesting uh, sort of characterization problem. Austin, what's... Uh, I, I just wanted to, to note that I think there's a tricky balance to be struck between two of your points that I think that is what the most government officials are trying to walk right now. One is 
you can't say this is a disaster because I mean that's that's terrible and and yes. I think Gary and I you know clearly agree that it's really not a disaster. At the same time, you have to be concerned about precedent setting. If you say, "Beh, it's a bunch of secret cables. Who cares?" Next time it will be you know TSSCI information that really could do grave damage to U.S. national security interests. So I think you have to sort of walk that line between saying it's not that bad, yep. but not just saying, well, who cares? It's not a big thing. Yeah. You know, we've already admitted that things that are secret are not secret forever. And so what we're really arguing about here is how soon. Yeah. You know, and in his case, he's saying last February when I got this dump wall put together, uh, that's soon enough. Yeah. And that's yeah. it. And the government would disagree uh, yeah. about some of the cables at least. Yeah. Robert? Thank you. Thanks. Um, well, I want to begin with um, with a little anecdote. Um, it's not my anecdote. It's William Sapphire's anecdote. Now, some of you are probably too young to know who William Sapphire is. William Sapphire was a longtime op-ed columnist for the New York Times. Um, and before that, uh, he was a speechwriter for Richard Nixon in the White House. Um, and he used to tell a story. I heard him on television tell this story a number of times about um, a, a time in the early 1970s when he was writing a draft of a speech for the president um, about Vietnam using some sensitive um, um, uh, information that he had gotten to help him with the speech from Henry Kissinger's office at the National Security Council. Um, and he, he, because it, there was sensitive material on the speech, he wrote the draft, wrote at the top of the draft, um, top secret, eyes only, no distribution. And then he gave the draft of the speech to Bob Haldeman, who was Nixon's chief of staff, to give to the president. And the typical course was Nixon would read the draft, mark it up, um, indicate what kinds of changes he wanted, and then send it back through Haldeman to the speechwriter, who would then rewrite. Um, so Sapphire gives the speech to uh, Nixon, waits a couple of days, and nothing comes back. And he calls up Haldeman and says, I got to finish that speech for the president. Where's the draft? And Haldeman says, "Oh, it's it's classified top secret. You're not cleared for top secret. You can't see it." And Sapphire says, "But I I wrote top secret. It wasn't some security officer who classified it. I wrote just wrote top secret because I didn't want it to be distributed too widely. Sorry, it's classified. You can't see it." <laughs> Sapphire used this story. It was much funnier when he told it. Um, <laughs> Sapphire used this story to make a point um, that, that uh, Lee made in his, his opening uh, remarks that's a very important point, I think, and that is about the tendency toward a government system like, uh, like, the, American, uh, like the American system toward overclassification. And he would say when he told the story, it's very easy to stamp something top secret. It's very hard once it's stamped to unstamp it. Now it happens, and as Gary points out, there are lots of things that are declassified, and there are ways of declassifying things, and sooner or later, almost everything will come out. Um, but I think um, the so far, up until this very moment, um, this very hour, um, I think the WikiLeaks episode um, has been, in, in a large sense, a huge missed opportunity to think at a slightly broader level about that problem and about that issue and about the, the sort of level and amount and extent of classification and the culture of secrecy that, um, that surrounds a lot of what the government does. And this has to do not just with national security um, issues. That's sort of the area of the government's activity where the need for secrecy is the most obvious and intuitive. But it's also true, it's true everywhere in the government. Um, in the areas of government documents that I tend to look at are not at all about national security, they're about all kinds of other things. But still, things tend to be very tightly held um, and government officials tend to get very upset um, when things leak out beyond what they, the officials, think is the proper channels. Um, and the, there's, a, there's a sort of a presumption that Lee, Lee, Lee framed um, at the top that the government should sort of by rights be able to classify uh, whatever it wants um, without any review, without any question that it's, it's the 
presumptive right of the government to say what is and is not available for, for the public to see, that its decisions are more or less presumed to be correct, um, and that somehow to question secrecy the way the WikiLeaks dump has, 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 has done um, is somehow seditious or unpatriotic. Um, and, and the presumption um, um, or the conclusion, if I can disagree with Gary a little bit, that this sort of dump, uh, data dump is irresponsible uh, in, in, the, in the big picture, which isn't to say that there might be specifically harmful things that it's, it's irresponsible to release for, for reasons of you know, this life and limb of, of, of people um, um, that might be put at risk. But um, I think it's been a missed opportunity for a couple of reasons. One of them... Uh, missed opportunity to sort of raise bigger questions about secrecy. And I'll, I'll, I'll say something about um, the role of academic institutions and, um, and scholars and students in that in a, in a moment. But I think it's been a missed opportunity for a couple of reasons. One has to do with um, um, Julian Assange um, himself. Um, First of all, I mean, several, a lot of us have probably read the so-called manifesto and other things that he's written. He's a dreadful writer. He's a very bad writer. Um, he's something of a bloviator. He's something of a megalomaniac. He's not a very disciplined or systematic thinker. Um, it's not very clear um, what it is he's talking about most of the time. Um, but to the extent that it, it is... To the extent that at least I am able to interpret what he says, he it's it's extremely conspiratorial. Um, he has this view um, that someone else alluded to of the government as a sort of big conspiracy. Um, um, he's and he's too he's very stuck on this sort of faith in technology or he's under, there's an understanding Assange understands democracy as a as an engineering problem. Right, not as a problem of human systems um, and human behavior, but as an engineering problem. And if we can just, you know, sort of rewire the circuits so that all of the information that the government has is available, then we'll break the conspiracy um, because the, the the nodes that are part of the conspiracy won't be so linked to each other anymore in a closed way. Um, um, or, or, some, or something like that. It's, this, is, this is my best attempt at glossing on what Assange uh, seems to be saying. So I think that the, the, the WikiLeaks ethos, the WikiLeaks um, um, sensibility leads us away from really thinking about these hard questions and difficult trade-offs about secrecy and transparency um, um, and lead us down the road of thinking about technology and the role of, of the internet in sort of busting open um, the closed quarters of, of the government. Um, I think there's also been um, um, a sort of hysterical reaction on the part of a lot of politicians in the United States. Um, um, Joe Lieberman. Um, I cannot emphasize this enough. I am not related to Joe Lieberman. <laughs> um, Joe Lieberman, who's one of the most distinguished and sometimes thoughtful um, um, officials, uh, elected officials in terms of national security affairs and, and, and military affairs, um, is calling to investigate everyone right and left all over the place um, and to prosecute not just the leaker um, and not even just WikiLeaks, um, but the New York Times. He wants to prosecute the New York Times, for heaven's sake, um, for, for, for running stories about these things and, and, and running excerpts from these documents. Um, he's proposed this um, you know, a, a, a amendment to the Espionage Act um, um, to, to sort of change the rules of the game, the legal rules of the game. Not that any of this will happen, um, but this is a very prominent, um, um, serious elected official. He's not a complete goofball. Um, um, per, per taking a very hard line against any kind of flow of information in this kind of way. 
Um, and at the more goofball end of the spectrum, Cong uh, Congressman-elect Alan West of Florida, if you read about this guy, um, he called yesterday or the day before for explicitly for censorship of news outlets, sort of prior restraint on what they publish, that, that not, not only should the New York Times have to go to the, to the government head in hand and saying, well, here are some things that we're thinking of printing, what do you think? that the government should be, active, be able proactively to sort of stop them from publishing things. Um, and he used the word collaborators to describe media organizations. It's not clear collaborators with what, but it's a sort of a provocative word. Um, so there, there's been a sort of crazed reaction inside some quarters, at least, of the American government um, to this. Some people have come out looking pretty well, looking pretty good. Gates was mentioned. Hillary Clinton made a similar statement early on that this will not probably amount to as much as people fear. Um, Gates and Clinton pretty much professionally have to say that. Um, um, they couldn't very well go in front of the public and say, oh my god, this is a total disaster. The whole edifice of American foreign <laughs> policy is crumbling. Um, not a good professional move on their part. But even, you know, but, but, um, but the guy who's come out of this smelling the best, frankly, is Ron Paul. Now, Ron Paul and Hillary Clinton don't get usually mentioned in the same complimentary sentence. Um, um, so, so this is not a universal reaction among, among, among American public officials, but there is this tendency toward hysteria about this that I think has, again, deflected the public conversation away from the bigger, more important questions about secrecy and, and transparency on the one, uh, um, and that, that trade-off and balance. Um, so let me say a little bit about that from, an, from the point of view of, 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 of academic institutions. Um, Lee is absolutely right to caution prudence um, if you're, if you're, uh, if you are, if you, your career goals have you um, heading toward, say, the State Department. Um, I, I'm for the for the moment less interested in that problem than in thinking about what should we, as citizens of a university, as teachers, as scholars, as researchers, and as students. Um, what should our view of this whole episode be, and how should we, in that role, think about the problem of this trade-off between secrecy uh, and transparency? Um, and here I, I take a fairly hard line, ab almost absolutist line. The university as an institution and as a place where scholarly inquiry happens depends entirely on openness of information. This is really extremely true in my and Austin's home discipline of political science, where what we, what we do professionally um, is observe what governments do and what government officials do and what other people do in relation to governments and, and try and describe them and, and explain them and, and make inferences about them. Um, and to understand how government institutions and governments and dem democratic and non-democratic systems of various kinds work. Now, is there a tension between the need? So, so we depend for not just our individual professional lives, but for the sort of health and well-being of institutions like SEPA, like Columbia, like any university, on openness of information. Um, now, of course, there are lots of circumstances and lots of reasons why governments need to be free from the kind of scrutiny that we would like to ha be able to train on them. Um, people need to give leaders private, unvarnished advice. Um, there are sensitive negotiations in which people, people's positions shift over time and people say things um, that they might not want to get out of the room. Um, 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 and then there are these there are these cases where people's lives are actually at risk um, because of discussions about troop movements or operations um, in a military uh, in kind of military operations that are coming um, that it would be really dangerous if someone else knew about. There's all kinds of reasons why, in particular cases, um, we should shrink from openness. Um, um, you know, and as, as we've heard, d d diplomacy is kind of a dirty business. There's lots of skullduggery. There's lots of gossip. Um, there's lots of sort of embarrassing little tidbits. Um, um, but as, as I think 
um, some other some of my colleagues have already said, these the leaks don't appear to have irreparably damaged the American the United States' ability to conduct foreign policy. And in fact, if anything, um, the the emerging consensus seems to be that what we've seen so far shows that the United States is pretty good at this. Um, you know, these are diplomats doing their job. Um, what the government says it's doing is pretty consistent with what it's actually doing. Are there embarrassing things that have come out? Yeah, sure. Um, you'd rather that foreign leaders weren't flying around with, you know, $50 million in, in cash, although I'm still scratching my head to figure out how you would carry $50 million um, on an airplane without the Pentagon Papers shopping cart. Um, Robert, Robert, I want to make sure we've got enough yep. time for questions. So, um, so, so but uh, just, just one final point. Um, I think the, the, the if, if, as Lee says, the, even if, as Lee says, the United States is at the more transparent end of this, this, the, the, the spectrum, as citizens of a university, it's our professional obligation to keep pushing for transparency. Um, and I think the question then is how, as Austin said, to structure the classification system so that we filter out mi at, at, at minimally the things that are actually what I mean, are in Gary's third category, the harmful. Um, other than that, you know, bring it on. So, so there's a very important point that Robert's making that needs to, I think, just be emphasized, and that is that there is a kind of constitutional there is a constitutional dimension to this. What are the rights of citizens, scholars, and the press to publish what they can get their hands on? But there's also an issue of public policy, which is quite apart from the Constitution and what rights right. that gives us. We can design a system as we wish in terms of that's what the Freedom of Information Act uh, is. It's not a constitutional norm. It's a public policy. It's a statute. And I think it's interesting what you raise is how this has not yet been translated, this whole episode, into a broader question about how should, what have we learned from this about how the system should be structured as a matter of policy in terms of secrecy versus disclosure? Hassan? Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> I uh, begin by saying and um, re actually repeating what the previous speaker very rightly said. Um, that indeed WikiLeaks is not the ideal way to access information, but as an academic, as a scholar, everything, every information which is available in the market or through any source, irrespective of the source, is kosher for me. Kosher, in a sense, um, for using it as within the research tools. Having said that, I'll mentioned that it reminded me of, of um, the motto of um, um, the motto of my alma mater, which was um, Government College Lahore in Pakistan, which was courage to know. And I was thinking about also in terms of courage to leak, um, and, and a difference between courage to know and courage to leak, having myself benefited from uh, declassifying some of the stuff in my book on my own accord. Um, it, it is intrinsic, it, it is deeply linked with this idea of what is the ideally the responsibility of a teacher and a scholar. At one level, yes, providing objective um, and diverse opinions and perspectives. At another level, it is also the prime responsibility of a teacher and scholar to be above any political considerations, any religious considerations, and I would even argue any national considerations. For a scholar, it has to be objective based on the facts, based also on, on the information that is available in the market. Now there are of course dilemmas. Other than this political, uh, political religious and national considerations, there, there is another aspect, which is social responsibility. And the dilemma that I, I would very, very briefly mention is, I, I uh, do blog and the day, um, the first uh, the, the, the set of doc documents were released. Um, there were a couple of documents released by Guardian uh, where there was a very specific mention of some sources of information which anyone, in fact, who, who's working on Pakistan-South Asian relations uh, would know that there was a mention or clear reference, in fact, to names also. People within the government sector working very closely with the president and the prime minister who went out of their way after the meetings and gave information um, to the U.S. Embassy in Pakistan. 
the the challenge was uh, when i was mentioning those um, or providing links to those on my blog uh, whether to whether to in fact uh, mention those two uh, names prominently and of course i decided against it but i am just making this distinction of um, the political and other considerations or even national considerations with this um, social responsibility uh, at another level it is very critical for us to understand that uh, to to differentiate between an academic and a scholar a lobbyist and an activist um as a scholar though as i had argued um you can use any information uh, which is available because that helps you lead to to genuine rational objective conclusions but at the same same level you will not expect that from media for example um for, from an activist or from a lobbyist uh, but i will also briefly then mention and move on the i one point where i differ with with uh, some of the esteemed um, panelists is I, i think there is most definitely a lot of new and significant information which provides um new insights um ranging from uh, the the comments by the afghan intelligence chief that in 2009 he had received an offer from the pakistani intelligence uh, that they are ready and willing to um to bring mullah umar or some of the other taliban leaders on negotiation table and that um when the afghan intelligence chief went to the us ambassador in afghanistan he declined that um whereas from the official statements uh, we we get slightly um, different image same i think we need to also look at how these wikileaks this is information was interpreted and looked at within um, other countries um in for example in saudi arabia we were not expecting that um anything will be mentioned in the media uh, but it hugely impacts um saudi pakistan relations at one level it hugely impacts um iran's relationship with some of its neighbors um so it is very obvious to me uh, that there are there's new information for those countries especially in south asia and middle east which will have a very serious impact uh on us relations with those countries and also uh for many of the political leaders for instance this was very insightful uh, to to see um that the us diplomats in fact um were, were regularly talking to the pakistani military chief and uh, those things which came out uh, were quite unexpected um also one can critique um that approach as well why us ambassador or a us diplomats um in, in any country are talking to the military military elites for example um on issues which are purely domestic on issues which are purely uh, political uh, especially talking to the military leaders then give a very different kind of impression and image if you involve general kani in case of pakistan on political issues indirectly um, you are sabotaging democracy in that country so in, in so many ways this is the way these uh, wiki leaks and this new information has also been um, interpreted in those countries and i think we we need to look at that finally i'll close with uh, by my mentioning that um, what are the components of um, a, a free academic or university environment and i would argue um, objectivity at one level freedom of speech freedom of thought and a neutral academic environment um it is based on this that that you can really pursue um, or go for this pursuit of knowledge um and i think wikileaks whether we like it or not whether the people who did it whatever their interest was um at one level might be damaging uh, for us policy interests but at a larger global level um that provides more knowledge that might uh, provide um more bases or foundations um for 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 a change in policy in in a creative fashion okay so that's a really interesting array of views uh on this and and that's what uh, we really set out to uh that's what we hope for and that's what we've gotten what i would propose is that uh, in the 10 minutes we have uh 12 minutes that we take a number of questions and then people can answer if we take one question and then everybody answers or a few people will end up with one question So uh if, if just take a series of questions there's a microphone in the middle i gather that's where people should go Should i begin Um I, I I'm a neighbor of Columbia University and I'm a 50 year WBAI listener member and caller you may recognize my voice Um I I am glad for any kind of uh increased understanding of the world 
um, because um, I went to Queens College and graduated in 52, and I've gone to Cooper Union in the art uh, thing um, at night. Uh, and I've tried always to increase my knowledge. Okay, I, I, uh, the I point think I want to make, make sure is, it's a question. And yeah, well, it's, it a, question. it's about information. I s was speaking to a chap who uh, was firm in his conviction of being a good American, and um, I said to and and he, and he, uh, something came up. We were watching the TV of Holbrook, and the, the picture of him as an his latest pictures. He seemed like such a soulful person. Would you agree? He had this look of uh, the the future and, and the pain. I, I, now I, the point I want to well, what, thank what you. Is the, question? Uh, the point I wanted to make is, at one point I uh, brought up to him. Uh, uh, he said he was anti-gay. And I, I said to him, do you know that Dick Cheney's daughter, uh, and it's come out in the press, and it's a knowledgeable fact, okay, is gay. Sir, sir I, and I'm sorry. And the point I'm trying no, no, to no, make no, no, is... No, I, wait a minute. Just wait a minute, please. Sir. Just ask the question. Uh, uh, the point is, he almost couldn't the, believe... The, the question. The question. The question is, what is the truth? What is going on with our government? You spoke of conspiracy. Okay. Would you say so, the well, war in Iraq was a conspiracy against, shall we say, the American people? That okay. such so unemployment we've got that question. is so. Okay. We've got, thank Did I go you. too far? Did I bother you, my dear sir, yeah, thank who's you. the leader? You might also want thank to say what much. your incomes are. Yeah. Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next. And I think I'd like to limit the questions to students. Okay, this is a this is a SEPA program, so let's just have students. Uh, I'm yeah. a first year SEPA student. Uh, I want to thank all the panelists. My question is: Is there a possibility that whether or not the uh, WikiLeaks has handled uh, their editing or their release of information very well, that the the organization come kind of comes out of a vacuum of journalism? I think certainly a lot in my generation, especially those in interested in international affairs, feel like especially in the lead up to the Iraq war, especially the American media, didn't play a very uh, investigative role in journalism. And that, especially if you follow the, the 24 Hours News Networks, you might assume that the most pressing issues in the United States are um, the plague of uh, homosexuality or so the war on Christmas. Very, that's a very interesting question. Given what is widely recognized as the failure of journalism, to really cover adequately a lot of the major actions of the government in the does that stimulate a counter movement to, that has uh, more uh, disclosures? Okay, we'll take Thank that you. question. Yep, student. Yeah, I'm for Steve <laughs> <laughs> um, So I I'm, uh, wanted to know about the scenario after WikiLeaks. So uh, if the governments were more transparent enough the leaks would, would not be added more significance. So thinking into consideration, the future government should be more transparent in conducting their foreign policy or not. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, I'm Pepem student. I have a question. I understand the freedom of speech and freedom of press are the basic rights for American people, but do you think such freedom has its limit? Thank you. Freedom has its limits. Has its limits. Yeah. Whether freedom has its limits. Yeah. Question? Hi. Uh, my name is Jernay. I'm an a undergrad at General Studies. I have a question mainly for, for you and Ms. Bell. Um, from the media companies you have talked to, are they getting ready for a big battle in the, in the courts? Can you mm -hmm. sort of talk about that? Mm -hmm. Hi, this question is to Mr. Abbas, uh, and I address it to him because I was able to listen only your presentation. Uh, but when you uh, distinguish between uh, the uh, qualifications of the academics uh, versus the journalists and the activists, aren't you somehow um, taking a self-serving um, uh, standing uh, by um, assuming and uh, somehow um, haughtily that uh, the academics uh, have either higher moral standards or higher 
intellectual qualifications, and most importantly, um, I don't know if any of you have already seen, and sorry, <laughs> President Bollinger, <laughs> uh, inside the uh, job, uh, how badly uh, uh, academics in, in my own field, ec economics, and specifically both Columbia and, and Harvard, uh, come across as uh, 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 ideals of just uh, uh, knowledge for the sake of knowledge. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. let, let's get real. I mean, okay, thank you very much. Hi, my name is uh, Sinova. I'm a Norwegian uh, visiting scholar here, and I'm a sociologist. Uh, I also want to tap into the question of uh, the high ideals of uh, researchers, uh, and also sort of go back to that um, this moment of uh, being a reflective about um, secrecy and openness. Um, so could you go, I was, so this is a question to Abbas and Lieberman, because um, no one here talked about personal privacy. And that's a dilemma that I at least see, um, especially concerning researchers who I do think should have higher standards than journalists. Okay. Thank you. And last question. And then we'll... uh, thanks for this uh, distinguished uh, uh, guest from the, give us this uh, informative speech. And I'm a Papam student. And I also worked in the media before I came to study in Columbia University. And uh, as the president said, uh, you gave the example about the Patkin document in 1970s. And uh, I, th I think it seems as if some of you agree that we should uh, strike a balance between the government regulation and the uh, freedom speech, uh, this like the freedom uh, press from the uh, media. But how this balance can be struck, is how we can achieve that. Is it by law or by regulation? Or do, do you afraid uh, that they will be uh, saying that there is a the violation of uh, freedom of speech, which is, I think, is a fundamental value for the United States. And also it's uh, for uh, other countries, maybe mm -hmm. in China, because okay. I'm Chinese. It's kind of a, uh, it's a like this criticism. It's about a, a ha lack of the human rights and the press of freedom. And how do you say okay. it's common? Thank you. Great. So let's all give a run at this. I'll start by saying, yes, there are limits on, on uh, disclosures, on free speech, on free press. The United States has a, a, a whole bunch of, of limits um, uh, on free speech, free press. However, the United States goes the furthest in protecting free speech, free press. I think the interesting question uh, that, that is raised for someone like me, uh, many interesting questions, but one is, I think a lot of the world is wondering how much to go down the route that the United States has done on free speech and free press over the last century. They're wondering. They've got free markets going. They've got uh, huge amounts of, uh, of uh, middle class and, and wealth that's, that's well. How much should they open up? And I think we have to be able to explain to them, to the rest of the world, this is something that we have to live with, this kind of openness. And of course there have to be some limits, but not as much as you think. And you can cope with a world that has this kind of rough and tumble openness and messiness. And that's not an easy case to make on the world stage at this point. Singapore, China, a number of other countries, they don't buy this kind. They see the WikiLeaks or the Pentagon Papers as terribly undermining the trust of the public in government. We see it as actually reinforcing the trust of people in government. And that's a, that's a case that, that will have to be debated over the next decade or more. Is the media preparing for a big battle with the government in the United States over this disclosure? Absolutely not. There is no chance in the world that the Attorney General is going to be suing, prosecuting the New York Times, even though I could give them a theory, and I'm sure internally they've gotten theories, that Pentagon Papers doesn't cover this case. Just a theory. I could give it to them uh, for a fee. Uh, <laughs> There's no chance in the world that they're going to uh, be so. That, that's the nature. That's how far we've come. 50 years ago, 
different outcome, perhaps not today. Emily, do you want to say anything? Um, yeah, just going back to the question about has this, uh, does this represent a vacuum um, or it, has it highlighted a failing of the press? Um, I think to some extent it has in the same way that if one thinks about, uh, think about it as the underground press of the 60s, that again, there was just a, it is a natural and disruptive, um, I think, generational reaction to what is seen as being reasonably poor service. I don't think it's unfair to say that the, uh, there were journalists, individual journalists, who wrote extremely powerfully and well um, about why uh, there were no uh, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Um, and there were journalists who wrote very, very sort of powerfully and well about the failing of very complex financial instruments, but they tended to be addressing an extremely narrow audience. They were not addressing, you know, the, the Fox News audience or the, yeah. the, the, the broader yeah. audience. Um, and to that extent, I think that um, most media organisations also, at the time that um, WikiLeaks were doing it, and again, this doesn't endorse their methods or any of their kind of their, their, their rather muddled and, and poor thinking around this. Most organisations didn't have most even mainstream media organisations simply didn't have the, the the technical kind of foresight to understand that this is how disclosure was going to happen and, 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 and what that would mean. So I think there's a completely legitimate uh, reaction amongst. Uh, people who have um, a deeper understanding of this who are, or who are younger to say that this is a sort of a different type of um, mm -hmm. dissemination and disclosure. And we're very, very disappointed with, with, with the way, and, and to some extent, elements of the press have become completely calcified into the establishment that they are meant to be reporting on. Mm -hmm. And it's not a bad thing for the press to be reminded to, to the extent to which that has happened as well. Mm -hmm. Quick closing comments, Gary. Just one point on the, uh, because Vietnam, not Vietnam, but, but the Iraq war has come up, and I think this is all about the Iraq war. Just as the Pentagon Papers was all about Vietnam, basically the American people feel that they were betrayed by their government and by their media. And they therefore feel that almost any remedy is worth it. And I think that's reflected in the ultra-conspiracy theory uh, thinking of Assange, who uh, he thinks everything the government is doing is a conspiracy. Sometimes it is. And if it is a conspiracy, it should be revealed. It's just, I would argue that in, in the particular case that Assange has done here, there's no conspiracies. And uh, so he's, he's making an argument, if anything, the dump of information that he's given us is pretty conclusive evidence that the government do other things besides conspiracies. And I think it disproves this point, actually. But in favor of uncovering conspiracies, I'm all in favor. Austin. Uh, just briefly on the balance between secrecy and openness. I mean, uh, in a university environment, I think you have to be, as, as Rob eloquently said, uh, in favor of, of openness. But I, I do want to defend the government's right to hold things secret. Um, it puts me in a tough spot. I, I always appreciate having information, as, as Hassan said, in order to make better judgments. But at the same time, you know, people's lives really are on the line in a variety of ways. And the way the United States understands the world is on the line, right? Because if intelligence, <coughs> excuse me, sources and methods are compromised, that's, that's like a finger in the eye for the United States understanding how the world works. So there, there's a risk that in trying to become so transparent, you, you actually put cataracts in your own eyes in terms of being able to perceive the world. So I think you know, we always have to keep that in mind. Secrecy, you know, there is an overclassification problem, but there is also a legitimate need to do it um, in a variety of contexts. Robert? Um, I want to say another word or two about this, the, the, the secrecy versus uh, transparency question. Um, um, and about the role of, of, of academics and researchers in this. I don't want to um, preempt uh, Hassan's uh, answer because the question was directed at him. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that um, academics have or, or have a higher stand, set of standards or higher ideals. Um, we have one set of professional standards and ideals to do what it is that we do, and, and other people in other um, walks of life, as activists or journalists or what have you, have different standards. I think there's a common interest among, or there's a zone of common interest among those three groups in openness. Um, but I think there, that, that comes for very different, um, different reasons. Um, and just on the question of, of personal privacy, which is actually one of the very delicate, I think complicated 
um, um, facets of this whole question of, of openness. Um, I'll only say there that obviously that's a concern. It's something that, that we as researchers always need to be worried about, and it's something that we as research scholars and as universities actually have a reasonably good system of dealing with. We do research all the time that involves potential violations of people's privacy. We do surveys and ask people things. We, we do medical um, um, trials of, 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 we do all kinds of things that are in, potentially invasive and violate people's personal privacy. And universities and the government and other organizations have come up with decent, imperfect, but pretty reasonable protocols for dealing with those things. Think about the United States Census. Every year, every 10 years, we ask every single person who lives in the United States to give us information, we the government, right? And there, it's, it, so we have information on 300 million people, none of which ever gets released in a way that's identifiable with a single individual. So we, we as researchers know how to do this, but it's, an, it's another important thing to throw into the mix of, of this complicated balancing game. Thank you, Robert. And last comment from uh, Hassan. Thank you, and I will actually <clears throat> voice the same issue and concern. There's not enough time to go into the philosophy of teaching or scholarship, uh, but I, I was not trying to compare uh, the models or um, standards between different organizations, but I do know um, that in the history of nations um, or civilizations, I can't think of any nation where um, the, the academia or the people who are responsible for teaching, uh, teaching the students the next generation, where they, um, there were any faults or inadequacies in terms of their high standards or their thinking of their responsibility or profession um, as a sacred, a sacred responsibility, sacred in, in, a, in a secular sense here. So I'm not comparing, but I think for, for scholars, especially involved in teaching, um, the, the criterions are different. Uh, for media, for journalism, of course, I'm not saying that it's purely or just corporate interests or vested interests that are play. Um, absolutely not. Uh, but I think there is an expectation also in, in terms of responsibility also. Academics, researchers, and scholars um, have a higher responsibility for sure. Uh, thank you. We hope this was helpful uh, to you and interesting, and thank you very much for coming. <laughs>